She's recognized inside of ecosystem ecology and in fact across the environmental studies world as an important pioneer in the subfield of urban ecosystem ecology. Um, through her research on the effect of urban structure on ecosystem functions, um, particularly through nutrient dynamics, and also by integrating ecological and social theories with urban design, Mary works from the standpoint of ecology to enhance the development of cities as sustainable, coupled human natural systems. And when she talks, we'll get more of a sense of what coupled human natural systems refers to. Um, Mary's also noted across environmental studies fields as someone who is unusually um, facile at making cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary gestures. So while she is deeply grounded in and her work heavily informs the development of urban ecosystem ecology, she's also someone that works in collaborative ways with colleagues far beyond and outside of the ecosystem sciences to foster a, a much clearer understanding um, that is our goal within environmental studies. So I'm very excited to introduce her. Tonight's talk is called Reconceptualizing Urban Heterogeneity, Consequences for Understanding and Enhancing Ecological Processes to Foster Sustainability. So welcome, Mary. Thanks, Anne. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here at NYU. This is the second time I've had, whoa, there's no shelf. It's like really low. <laughs> Sorry, um, the second time I've had a chance to be here, so it's really exciting to see how the program has grown. And I had tremendous fun today visiting the class and discussing a little bit more casually how I approach my science and, and how I approach the integration work that I do across disciplines. I said the lights were okay when it was a little lighter outside. Now I'm getting a little blinded, so if we could bring them down actually a little bit, that would be great. Sorry to be um, so needy. But this is a wonderful room to give this talk in. So what I'm going to do, and, I, and I'm, I apologize right now because I tend to do things very, very quickly. I tend to speak fairly clearly, but if it's a problem, let me know. Um, I just get real excited and things, things just start flying. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do a lot tonight, which is probably, um, I think, a good idea. You'll see. But what I'm both, mace, bleh, this is a great start. What I really want to start with is this idea of urban heterogeneity. And I'm going to be defining these terms very carefully for you as I work through some of my examples. But the idea here is that landscape ecology and urban ecosystem ecology very much is trying to establish the link between the way we build cities, the structure of those cities, and ecosystem functions of all types, whether we're talking about um, heat dissipation or nutrient storage or biodiversity, whatever ecosystem function you want to pull out, we are, are, are testing the assumption that structure is somehow related to those functions. And I'm going to argue that, therefore, we need to be careful about how we characterize and quantify structure if that's really our underlying assumption or hypothesis. And I'm doing this with the goal of trying to understand how we can build cities in a more sustainable way. And, and so what I'm going to do through the talk is I'm going to define for you what urban ecology is, just so that we're all on the same page. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what heterogeneity is specifically, define it. It's fairly simple, although we all come up at it with a little bit different perspective. So I want to make sure, again, that we're on the same page with what spatial heterogeneity is. And then I'm going to go through some data and some and, um, supporting story, basically building a story for you on how I'm testing the link between system structure and system function. What I want to end with, and I'll show you how I'm applying it to a different city. You've got context in there as a theme, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how applying it to a different city in a different biogeophysical setting may alter what I'm, what I'm doing. And end a little bit with a, conceptually where the field of ecology thinks about sustainability and a very related concept of resilience. Okay? So that's going to be conceptual and theoretical only. And I'm putting it at the end, which is an odd place, but I think it it works better at the end. I think you need kind of the front matter to see what I'm talking about. So we'll use it as a way to wrap up. So first of all, what is urban ecology? Well, let's first look at this word ecology. I'm defining it very, very inclusively here. So ecology is the scientific study of the processes influencing the distribution and abundance of organisms, the interaction among organisms, and the interactions between organisms and transformation and flux of energy and matter. So this is extremely inclusive. I start off by saying the scientific study because I talk to a lot of mixed groups. And so I right away want to say it's not a metaphor. It's not the way we use ecology on the street. It's a scientific study. So distribution and abundance of organisms. There's population ecology. The interaction among organisms. There's community ecology. And the interactions between organisms and transformation and flux of energy and matter. There's ecosystem ecology. Do all this across the landscape and through time. There's landscape ecology. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at this word urban and I'm going to leave it intentionally abstract, an ecosystem type. Well, this here is an abstract definition as well, right? I haven't told you what organisms, I haven't told you what types of interactions, I haven't told you what the flux of what kind of matter. So that's abstract as well. So like all concepts, they're abstract and you have to specify them when you actually operationalize it. So I will do that, but for now, let's leave urban as an ecosystem type. So here's a cartoon of what ecosystems are. Ecosystems have an organism complex, plants and animals, microbes, and a physical complex, temperature, wind, rocks, geology, and those are interacting. And they're interacting in some sort of boundary that the researcher or research question is going to define, okay? And then what we often do as ecosystem ecologists is we measure the inputs and the outputs of some sort of, um, that's really distracting out there, the inputs and outputs of some sort of currency, whether it's nitrate or organisms, a number, of, and we, and then what's the difference between the inputs and the outputs is what's cycling in the system itself. So it's very much what we call a budgetary approach, okay, which is a really common way that ecosystem ecologists quantify dynamics in their system. They look at some sort of input, look at that same thing in the output, and assess what's sticking in the system. Okay, so that's ecosystem ecology as a cartoon. So what are ecosystem types? Well, aquatic ecologists, their boundary might be the ring of a lake. The lake is the ecosystem forests, ecologists, agriculture, and rangeland. These are all different kinds of ecosystem types. Of course, they have different organisms and different interactions. You can study them at the whole lake scale, or you might study them at a much finer scale, just looking at the boundaries. You may study them changes through time or compare lakes across biogeophysical settings. So that's what ecosystem types are. Same thing for an urban landscape, okay? Urban systems, cities are not cities are not cities, which I know many of you know. I talk to a lot of ecologists even though urban was uh, very much included in the very first definition of ecosystems, uh, written by Tansley in 1925, the field has since forgotten it and pushed it aside. And it's only been recently that our field has taken it on. Um, so I have to remind scientists that it is actually an ecosystem type and that a city is not a city is not a city, right? So the biogeophysical setting that a city is put within, New York versus Sacramento, is going to be very, very different. Okay, we have different climates, we have different hydrologic cycles, we have different peoples, we have different cultures, we have different histories of economies, we have different realities of cultures. So we have a very different setting as well as um, the social and cultural context and, and current reality. Okay, so how do we then convince our ecologist friends that we're not doing something completely weird? Well, here's that cartoon of ecosystems and what I've done is just add the physical complex when I wanna apply it to a city Okay, the physical complex I now have called a built complex and the biotic complex I've, I've expanded by calling it a social complex. So they're all interacting and this is just a simple way to very tangibly for my ecologist colleagues to pull this out so that even though I would argue it was always there, pull it out a little bit more explicitly in a conceptual framework so that they can understand what we're talking about here. So the whole point of this is to basically say that urban ecology is not weird, it's still ecology in a new context, in a new system. So why study cities? Well, obviously it's where most people live. Science in this country is funded by taxpayer dollars. We need to understand systems that people are living in and affecting. It's also often hypothesized that uh, biological and physical conditions in a city is a precursor to global change. Some of the changes to atmospheric chemistry or to temperature or to, to variation in temperature and weather is that it's happening in cities as a result of land use land cover change is a precursor to what we can expect in quote unquote natural systems under global change scenarios. Also influencing non-urban landscapes. Okay, a lot of our working lands are immediately adjacent to urban landscapes and so there's obviously some cross boundary influences so we need to study cities so that we understand how they may be influencing our working lands or our conservation lands. And then also it's an opportunity for us to test theory in a very novel environment. Something ecologists always like to do and rarely get to because it's been said that urban is the last frontier for our field. So how are cities studied? Again, basic tools and approaches that are used all throughout science. We use gradients, we use spatial heterogeneity and patch dynamics, we use watershed approach, and we use biogeochemical and hydrologic budgets. If these don't mean anything to you, that's okay. I'm probably, I think I have examples where I'm gonna to touch on all of those, spending more time on spatial heterogeneity than the others. But all of these are very classic approaches used by every ecosystem ecologist. 
So these are very familiar and comfortable to them, and I'm, we're using exactly the same approaches, just in an urban environment. Okay. So I said that urban was in the original definition of ecosystem ecology, but that ecologists pushed it aside. Well, ecologists have been relatively late to the table for people who are studying cities. Social scientists, obviously, were way out ahead. And this is just a, a model. I use this as an example. I'm just going to give you a very quick timeline on the role of ecology in the study of cities. I have, I have three, what I call the three tides of urban ecology. And I'm going to, I argue the third tide is still in. But the first tide, which is this one, developed in the Chicago School Department of Sociology, didn't, it wasn't the work of ecologists, but ecological concepts were brought to bear, particularly the concept of succession and competition. And the idea that Park and colleagues came up with was basically that as people gather wealth or accumulate resources and, and, and power and place, they move in a very uh, trajectory way, very linear way, further out of the city. So you have these rings of different classes of people that represent a succession through competitive interaction and accumulation of wealth. Okay, so they're using ecological concepts, but it's done in the sociology department in Chicago. Not surprising, Chicago at the time was a super powerhouse in the development of ecological theory as well. So it's not surprising that these came together. What's interesting about this is that it's a very highly spatially deterministic model. So it's dealing with spatial heterogeneity, although in a very uh, non-realistic way. We all recognize this as a cartoon, right? This isn't exactly um, how cities are structured. So that was done in 1925. Here's another approach that was done in the 60s. This was done by ecosystem ecologists. In the 60s, there were some very large programs, uh, IBP program funded for ecosystem ecologists, looking at biogeochemical budgets at very, very coarse scales. So what you see here is a bunch of budgets, meaning inputs on the, uh, whatever, inputs over here, outputs over here to the air and to the water using Hong Kong as a city. And this is convenient because Hong Kong is an island city, right? So they're looking at the inputs, for example, of oxygen and water and food and petroleum, and the outputs of carbon dioxide and all those great things, dust, food waste. Okay, really, really big numbers. These are in tons per year. So really, really big numbers, gross numbers, right? Now this is useful because you can compare a city through time, or you compare across cities, or you might find out about really big places of consumption and waste that you might want to target some sort of remediation efforts for. What's key here, in my mind, is that Hong Kong, there are no, no people here, right? Other than maybe through waste and food, but this is just a, an empty box that just says Hong Kong. It doesn't tell you anything about the structure of Hong Kong necessarily. It's just looking at it blindly. When aerial photography and satellite images became more and more available, this is a kind of urban approach we saw. And this is the development or the growth of Baltimore and DC from 1792 to 1992. And you can see that it's been growing steadily until it's now this big corridor now. And this is the original, some of the early approaches of current or contemporary ecologists and geographers that basically asked the question of what is urban and what is not and took the approach of urban sprawl or urban growth. And so that was the focus of studies and still is. It's still a very important area of research. In the middle 80s or 90s, a new program was started called the Urban Rural Gradient that took a look at deciduous forest patches along a gradient from um, from New York, Central Park is ground zero, which we used then, unfortunately. This was early, remember, late 80s, um, up into northwestern Connecticut. So it's all along the same soil series. And the idea was that these boxes here are different forest patches, and we looked at the forest um, composition and nutrient cycling and tree regeneration and all sorts of basic ecological things that ecologists do in different urban contexts, thinking that urbanization was more intense on this end, a lot less intense on that end, and ask the question of how does a degree of urbanization influence the forest dynamics. So this, but, but all of our work was focused in the forest, okay? So we call this ecology in the city, okay? Because it's still studying just the green bits. And this is where, I, where I'll argue we are today. And that's taking a much more integrative approach, looking at the green bits and the gray bits and the brown bits. And this is a false color red in, uh, image, so the vegetation is red, okay? And the buildings and the pavement are, are gray. So this now is our shift. We call this now ecology of. So we've gone from ecology in the city to ecology of the city. And what I mean by that is now, rather than just studying the green bits in the city, we're looking at all components of the city as an integrated whole. So we're looking at the built and non-built components and integrating across them and incorporating people. 
So this has caused a conceptual shift in how we characterize our landscape. And I've got these two cartoons just to illustrate the point quickly. We used to have this view of our systems. We're interested in conserving some sort of patch, some sort of remnant past landscape, whether it's a, a woodlot or whatever, okay, in some sort of hostile matrix. So this is very much a conservation ecology view. You've got a target that you want to protect. You want to prevent anything from the matrix going in and destroying your patch. And we're shifting now to this, and I would argue that this is more from the landscape ecology perspective, where we don't discount or have a binary system at all in our landscape. We just recognize that there's areas of contrast in the landscape, okay? And that's what I'm trying to depict using the different colors and the different shapes of these, quote, patches, okay? So this whole field of patch dynamics and spatial heterogeneity is clearly in the intellectual home of landscape ecology. And asking questions about how the structure of this landscape affects the function is, is what landscape ecology is founded on, okay? So this is the conceptualization I'd like you to have in your mind rather than this. Okay, so what is spatial heterogeneity? Let's just take a couple slides, step back, and define it very clearly. Hopefully it's clear. But what is spatial heterogeneity? Well, really, if you just pull those two words apart, you know that it's some sort of contrast or pattern in the landscape that's spatially explicit. You can map it, okay, very tangibly. It's got a spatial component to it. So how do you do that? Well, you're defining some sort of pattern by a criteria that's up to you to define. You've got to say what it is that you're looking at. And by default, if you have a criteria, and I'm going to show you an example of what I mean here. If you have a criteria, then by default, you're going to be drawing patches and boundaries. You're going to decide what is in your criteria and what isn't, for example. So here's an example for you. Here's an air photo of an area up in the Hudson Valley. And what you see down here are two patch maps or patch mosa mosaics, excuse me, of the exact same air photo, but done very differently because I used two different criteria. So in this panel here, my criteria is what is forest and what is not. So what is forest is in green and what is not is in purple. But in this patch array over here, I change my criteria. And now my criteria is land cover. So you can see many more patches because I'm pulling out agricultural fields from forests, from water bodies, from settled areas, okay? So I switched my criteria from forest, non-forest to land use or land cover, all right? So anytime you switch your criteria, presumably you're also gonna switch the pattern that you pull out of your system. And what this means then is you're going to quantify your landscape structure or ask questions about its relationship to function very, very differently depending on this view that you take, okay? So that's really important. And, you know, I should tell you that, that this sounds really simple. I'd say 80% of the ecologists don't get this concept. It's always buggered up. Okay, so what else happens with spatial heterogeneity? Well, you have processes that are happening at different rates and perhaps even different types of processes in those different patches. You could have patches that are waterlogged or saturated soil and those that aren't, in which case your processes are gonna be very different, um, for example. It's really important that this concept stay scale neutral. Now, when I say scale neutral, I do not mean scale independent. Scale very much matters. Temporal scale and spatial scale very much matters. What I mean by scale neutral is that it can be applied across scales both in space and time, and I'll show you an example. And then all of this has to be, again, like the definition of ecology, um, has to be defined or specified in your research question. You have to say, if I have a student come up to me and say, is my system spatially heterogeneous? Yeah. Was my answer useful to you? No, I'm guessing, because you have to specify what it is that you're interested about to, to establish that spatial heterogeneity. Okay, so this is what I mean by scale neutral. Here's two different photographs taken at very different scales. In this one, you see a landscape. You see uh, grazing lands. There's a sheep to prove it. You see some tree blobs, and you see water, and you see differences probably in elevation, okay? In this one, this is, well, you know, if you stuck your face down and looked at the desert floor, what you might see where you see patches of bare soil and patches of blue-green algal crust, and you see two, let's call it two species of plants, one with yellow flowers, one with white flowers. Okay, really, really different scales. This is on the meter square scale. This is on the kilometer scale. Very, very different scales, but you could still apply the concept of spatial heterogeneity. You can still ask questions here about maybe land water interaction across patch boundaries, okay, where you have aquatic patches and terrestrial patches. You could ask questions about grass tree patches. Here you might ask questions about bare, about bare soil and vegetated portions or between the white flowers and the yellow flower shrubs. Very same concepts being applied at radically different scales. So it's a scale neutral concept. Okay, so how do we depict spatial heterogeneity in cities? 
typically what we use is land use land cover. And this is what this map is. I'm going to spend a little time orienting you to this map because by the end of the talk, these shapes will be extremely familiar to you. So this is a classic land use map um, that I think all of you have probably seen where the forests are in green and the high density residential is in this, this um, gold color and we have some in institutional lands in blue and et cetera. Okay, so typical residential, industrial, commercial. This is the city of Baltimore. Here's the outline, the Chesapeake Bay. And this dark outline here is what we call the Gwens Falls watershed. Watershed approach is something we use throughout our research and basically it's something developed in the biogeochemical community, in, in the ecosystem ecology community where it looks at the water quality and quantity coming out of everything. So, sorry, I should start with the definition of watershed. A watershed is just an area that where every piece of water, every bit of water, rain, whatever water you put in that land area is going to flow out through one point, okay? So it's often decided topographically. Water flows downhill. That generally doesn't change, although sometimes it can. But we draw these topographically and all the rain and every bit of water that's used in this boundary is going to drain right out through there into the Chesapeake Bay. So it's a very convenient tool because the water that comes out integrates all the stuff that's happening on the land, right? It eventually comes out into water. And so we can measure the, the temporal and spatial dynamics of the amount of water coming out and the quality of the water coming out to tell us about what's going on in the terrestrial landscape. So it's a great integrating tool. And that's what we're doing in the Gwens Falls, using the Gwens Falls. So this is a, a method developed in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, now applied to a city. And we, had, we wanted to do it both because it's useful and because then our ecological colleagues would be calm. It's a method they're very familiar with. Okay, so the point though here is that this is a typical view of what spatial heterogeneity in a city looks like. Now, I wanna make a very clear distinction between land use and land cover because it's critical to the research I'm gonna show you. Land use is human social or economic activities taking place in a given area. Things like residential, commercial, industrial, those are land use categories. And that stands in contrast to land cover which is a physical pattern created by structural features. I'm gonna argue and hopefully convince you by the end of this that this is not an ecological variable, but this is. So all of my work really focuses on land cover and it's really critical to keep those distinctions. Okay, why do I keep those distinctions? I'm gonna show you a series of photos in Baltimore. This is downtown Baltimore. Again, it's those false color infrared aerial photography, so the vegetation is red. And you can see that this is a row house neighborhood, so the the different color roofs, but they're all together. There's no space between the homes. It's an alley community, so you have alleys in the back, but then you can see these main roads. So this is in downtown Baltimore. Much of downtown Baltimore looks like this. Here's a newer residential community, probably out, of the water, out in the upper parts of the watershed, recently converted from agriculture, typical cul-de-sac kind of community. You see a lot of grassy area. They typically plant their property boundaries with woody vegetation, but in general, you see a lot of, of open area. And here's an older residential community where you see a lot of houses built under the trees. You can still make out some roads. In the land use categorization, this would all be called residential, okay? And that's why it's so important to keep land cover separate because for ecological functions, things like nitrate storage, carbon storage, bird biodiversity, these landscapes are going to mean very, very different things when trying to link it to those ecosystem functions, maintaining biodiversity, for example, or retaining nitrate on the land. So that's why I, I argue this land use perspective is of no value because using that, this would all be considered the same. The spatial heterogeneity among these landscapes would be lost. And this is just some data from Ackerman and Stein done in 2008 that's looking at um, the amount of impervious surfaces in high density residential, low intense density residential, commercial, and industrial in counties in California, simply to show you that the percent of impervious cover, even though it's got the same land use category, is very different across these different counties. So it's just reiterating my point, although this time with data rather than images. Okay. So what I'm fundamentally interested in then is how does land cover as landscape structure or as spatial heterogeneity of the system link to ecosystem function? If we want to retain the function of these systems to keep them sustainable, how might we get some clues into their function based on their structure? And the reason this is really important is because it's the structure that we affect through our design, through our regulation, and through our policy, and, and through our personal management behaviors of our individual private property. So this is the link that I'm, I'm really focused on. So, sorry, let me go back. This is the picture of land use, and I've just argued that this might not be a useful thing to, do this, to understand this link between land cover 
and ecosystem functions. So I'm going to show you now my approach to developing a new classification to deal with this a little bit more explicitly and deal with land cover. And then I will, I will, after giving you a primer on that basically, come back to link it to ecosystem functions. So this new land cover is called Hercules for obviously, for marketing reasons. And it stands for High Ecological Resolution Classification for Urban Landscapes and Ecological Systems. Yes, it's a stretch, but it's been very convenient. And it really divides the urban landscape into three elements, which um, doesn't deal with aquatic features at all. This is terrestrial urban landscapes. So the elements in an urban landscape are building surfaces and vegetation. And I think we can agree that that pretty much sums it up. And then what I'm calling features are things like under vegetation, coarse versus fine texture vegetation, meaning woody vegetation, trees and shrubs, and fine vegetation, herbaceous, lawns, things like that. Surfaces can be paved or bare soil, and buildings, the relative amount or cover of them, as well as the type. Using um, LIDAR data, which gives us the height of buildings, we can separate the height of buildings into a typology, not only in their three, on their um, two-dimensional structure, but also their, their height dimension. Okay. So here's a couple of snapshots of what different patches might look like in this system. So if we compare patch A to patch B, obviously the proportion cover of buildings is, is much higher here. Um, and the proportion of fine vegetation or lawn is much lower than in B, but the proportion of coarse vegetation or trees is the same in these two patches. Okay? So A and B would be the same if you're only interested in coarse vegetation. C and D are very uh, different in coarse and fine vegetation, a lot more fine here, a lot more coarse here, but, but the same in terms of building, proportion building cover. Okay, so if you were interested in building cover, C and D would come out the same. So what this basically looks like, what I'm showing you here in this figure is a series of just thumbnail examples of different patches. And these are the, uh, the feature types that we, we uh, classify each patch with. And then we, we classify them using categorical numbers or percent, relative percent cover of that element. So four means more than 75%. So here we have essentially a forest patch, more, more than 75% of coarse vegetation and nothing else. Okay. So that's how you do this, this classification. I'll give you some more examples. But that's the basic idea. And here's a, here's a picture of one portion of our watershed, what it looks like once the patches are drawn. So it just gives you a sense of visually what this looks like. And because it's got those six elements and variation in any one of those elements can create a quote unquote new patch, this is an incredibly flexible system. Depending on your research question, you can query it and display your heterogeneity in a way that makes sense for your research question. So if you're interested in birds and you know that they nest in certain kinds of trees and so you're only interested in the distribution of trees in your landscape, you can turn off the variation in everything else and just display for yourself the variation in tree cover across your landscape. Okay, here's the variation of fine vegetation or buildings, or you could do all features together. So it's enormously flexible. Again, depending on your research question, you can decide what to do with it. Okay? It's also a layer in GIS. So if topography is important to you, stick it in there. If water features are important to you, you can stick them in there. We can, we can connect it to social data So there's from census, which I'll show you an example of. So it's intended to be a layer in your analyses with other kinds of data if you need it, if your research question requires it. So let me give you a visual in case I haven't convinced you yet that this is a better approach for these kinds of questions than pulling the standard land use land cover off the shelf that is readily available and often free. This one isn't, um, but working towards that. So here's the urban heterogeneity that we see, and using this patch-based land cover, based on land cover logic classification, this is the, the uh, classification you see. And I do this with undergrads, by the way. I show them this photograph and have them draw the patches, and they always draw them the same. So I get criticized a lot for this, saying that it's subjective. This portion really isn't. People are very, very good, much more powerful than computers. We cannot contrate, we've been trying for five years now, we cannot train a computer to assess or define those boundaries. If we use a pixel base, which is what these um, land use land covers generally are, land use land cover logic, this is what you get. So this reads the reflection off the satellite images and then merges the pixels that have like reflectance, okay, into these patches. And so this is the reason it looks pixelated is because it's pixel based. And that pixel size can be 30 by 30 or 60 by 60 depending on your images. And if I then lay that over the air photos, you can see that it does very well on large, consistent, homogeneous patches like the agriculture 
and the forest. But look what happens when you get into a more developed area. It's a mess. Okay, I don't really understand how you would ask questions using this because it is so messy. And part of this is because it's reading reflectance and buildings and pavement look the same. So it can't make that distinction. And the other reason is that heterogeneity in an urban area typically is at a finer scale than 60 by 60 meters. So you have what we call mixed pixels and it doesn't know what to do with that. So you end up with every single pixel being a unique patch unless you have some very large consistent patch. So it's really inappropriate for urban areas. So what we've done is we've drawn these patches through visual interpretation. As I mentioned, the human eye is much more powerful than the computer in doing this. But then we go through and we classify, let's take this patch as an example, we then classify our features into those, here's those um, percent cover breakdowns for those categories. We then classify it. This is the bugaboo. This is where multiple users will wildly disagree. Okay, in trying to evaluate, even though these class breaks are, tr are done on purpose so that we can cut down on decision time, you, know, you can basically ask yourself, is this more than a third of the landscape or less than a third? That's a little bit easier than trying to come up with a strict percentage. Even with that, we find that people come up with very different things. And part of it is variation in users, but part of it is really driven by the patch itself. How heterogeneous or distributed the elements are in the landscape or how clumped they are really affects your ability to do this right. So that's where we, we worked on the trying to automate. And we've got a digital classification system now. We're using some spatially, um, um, sorry, object-oriented classification software uh, where it basically reads the reflectance, but then you write a series of rules, of algorithmic rules, to get it to merge things based on, again, the land covers that you stipulate, which is, are the, the Hercules land covers, and then merges those patches. And so this is the patch. Um, that you come up with, and then what we do is we lay on top of that the Hercules patches, which were done through visual interpretation. And then the computer can very accurately quantify, again, here's our example patch, can very accurately quantify the percent cover of our elements. If we want to, for some reason, we can convert it back into our classes, no problem. And we've done a lot of that, which I'm not gonna go into today to kind of test this whole approach and its biases and where does it work and where does it not work. But that part we can automate, and that's really critical because that's the part that takes the longest. Okay, so now we have this tool to hopefully better quantify and describe the spatial heterogeneity of our landscape in the form of land cover. How does it work with ecosystem function? Well, this was the only model available. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what we learned using this model first. And we looked at the functions of water quality and quantity and nutrient retention, which is, of course, very highly related, and then heat dissipation. I'm gonna give you a, a little bit on that. Uh, okay, so the nutrient retention, what we're focused on primarily there is nitrate, a primary water pollutant uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. It's a critical pollutant of concern. It's what's declared the Chesapeake Bay and impaired waters. So we're very concerned with cutting nitrate export from the land into the water, okay? And I'm going to show you some of the mechanisms behind that, but that's our big concern there. So what happens when you build a landscape? How does your hydrology get altered? Well. If in an unbuilt hill slope, as water falls onto your hill slope, it's gonna follow the topographical breaks down to your streams. PowerPoint always eats these arrows. It's going to transpire some water out of the trees and some of it's gonna percolate into the water table and eventually also make its way to, its, to the stream. But when you build on that landscape, you change those dynamics a little bit. Uh, the water falls down, less of it gets transpired out because you have fewer trees, more of it's paved so the water gets into infrastructure and is shot right to the stream much faster. It tends to get shot to the stream through infrastructure, so in a very specific place as opposed to just fused, infused throughout. Uh, and it falls on surfaces that may be collecting pollutants that are picked up and then brought into the water. So when you build a landscape, you change the quantity, the timing, the location, and the quality of water. So those are the four changes that, that you do. Here's an example of what I mean by changing the timing. So we have a flow rate here in cubic meters per second after a storm, hours after a storm. In an urban landscape and in a forested landscape, you can see that the flow rate is much faster immediately after a storm um, and much more water than in a forested system because of the infrastructure, okay? It's sheeting off the impervious surfaces <laughs> and getting into those streams very, very fast. So we call that a very flashy system. And what happens is that we end up scouring out our banks and blowing out the fine sediment so that we change the nutrient dynamics and the, bio bio the biological community here. And we also alter the streamside vegetation, okay? Because what's happened is the water table now is dropped much lower. 
And I think my next slide will show you some data that, yeah. So here's the water table depth as you go down. So here's the surface of the soil, and as you go down, this line up here is in a forested system, and this line down here is in a suburban system. So you can see that though there's a lot of variation through the year, that in general your water table drops because of this physical scouring that happens as a result of the streams being very, very flashy. Well, what does that mean? That means you're disassociating now the water from the vegetation that's by the side of those streams. It can no longer reach that water. Okay? And we, in fact, we're seeing a shift so that the trees that are by the river are no longer riparian species, they're upland species. So what does that do to keeping nitrate out of the system? Well, riparian zones or streamside vegetation is really critical for keeping nutrients in the terrestrial system, or, or I should say preventing them from going into the aquatic system. And this was work done in 1984 by Peter, John, and Coral. It's a very classic textbook example where they looked at the nitrogen flux from a cornfield that had been applied as fertilizer and how it moved through the adjacent forested riparian zone and into the stream in the upshot of this doing this nutrient budget, so this is nitrogen they've measured in all these different pools and fluxes, the upshot is that as it moves from the corn through the riparian zone into the water, much of what went into the corn system was used either by the plants or blown off back into the atmosphere by processes happening in this riparian zone. Well, now that we've disassociated that, this function is no longer happening. So we've changed the structure with very important mechanistic consequences that then changes the function. So we've lost the ability of these systems to uh, retain nitrogen. So here is our watershed again. And what we've been doing since 1998, we have weirs, all these red dots, on the main stem or in some cases on side tributaries to measure water quality and quantity coming out of these streams, as well as this reference forested site up here. So if we look at some of the data very briefly, we can see nitrate in milligrams of nitrogen per liter over time here. Let's look, stay with me on these graphs because the colors are screwed up. Um, if you look here at this top one, the blue one is the forested reference site. So the forest is very good at taking nitrogen up either in the plants or you don't have this disassociation so that, water, that soil is staying very waterlogged and denitrification processes are going on. So you have very little nitrate coming out of those systems, okay? The red line in this figure is agriculture. So lots coming out of, agri of catchments that are predominantly agriculture. Not surprising, right? They're dumping a lot of nutrients in, fertilizer. And this green line is how much is coming out in the suburban communities. If we look at this one, it's set up the same way. The blue is still the reference site, and this is why you have to stick with me. The red is now no longer agriculture. Um, the red is now, the green stays suburban, and the red is now urban, okay? This was really, really surprising to us. We expected the urban landscape would have more nitrogen coming out of it because it has more infrastructure, it has less vegetation, it has less ecological functioning, we assumed. So we were very surprised and we got to wondering what this is. And it, it turns out that in the suburban area, there's a lot of septic systems, there's a lot of pet waste. It could also be uh, legacies from agriculture that was, it was converted into suburban. When you go to the literature and you say, okay, we need to retain, we need to improve riparian function in order to keep nitrate in the land and prevent it from coming out of the water, what do we do? Well, the top 10 activities associated with riparian management, this is a, a giant review that was done in 2007, the results were, well, your best strategy is to revegetate. If you want to improve water quality, what's the best thing to do? You create or maintain or improve your riparian buffer. Well, from what we know, this isn't gonna work. You can't, it's not functioning, so you can plant it all you want, but the trees are gonna die because they need a lot more water and they're no longer getting it. Um, so this, these strategies that we're very used to doing are no longer gonna work in this context because we fundamentally, by changing the structure, we fundamentally have altered the function. So we need to change our conceptualization of what riparian zones do, and we need to essentially blow them up is the way I've been characterizing this. And what I mean by this, this idea of expanding repairing boundaries comes out of the agriculture field. I showed you that classic study that was agricultural uh, landscape based, and that's what's going on here. The attitude is that if you put in a lot of nitrogen here, either widen this buffer zone or revegetate it to make sure it stays functioning. Well, we don't have this situation in cities. We can't widen these buffer zones because it's gonna be somebody's backyard, right? And we also have fundamentally different hydrologic uh, connections. So we need to lose this conceptualization of the riparian zone and instead think about it as a distributed riparian zone, not just streamside, but blow it up literally and think about it as distributed over the entire catchment. Convert our thinking from expanding riparian zones to regreening or changing the canopy in the entire catchment area 
whoa, sorry, I didn't mean to go that fast, so that we can slow that water down and increase the chances of that water being used by the vegetation or at least prevented from going into the waterways. So this is an example of the kind of work we've been doing looking at the urban tree canopy, um, trying to evaluate where it is and where we could increase it to be able to do this. And using an Iconis image, we can separate the lawn from the grass here. Um, and then we can let overlay parcel boundaries to basically determine what is in public rights of way that has different governance structures and might be able to facilitate some sort of increased canopy um, amount. And what is in private land? Well, obviously, a lot of this is in private land. And here it is as a graph where you can see the dark part of the bars are what's not usable, mostly because there's a building on it. Uh, the green is what is existing vegetation, and the light green is what we call plantable space. Okay, so you can see that if we want to increase our urban canopy, we've got to start talking to private property owners. And that right away changes our activities and what we can do and who we have to talk with. So this is an example. Actually, this, as a result of this work, Baltimore has passed a, a regulation of doubling their tree canopy. I think by 2014, I could be wrong on that, but um, as a re direct result of this work, that, that regulation has been passed. Okay, so how is the structure at a coarser scale than an individual parcel level, because that's a different kind of science, um, how do we think about structure of our landscape and consequences for nitrate coming out of the system? And this is using this typical model of land, of spatial heterogeneity with our water data, and we just simply ask, what's the relationship between the percent residential land and the nitrate yield coming out? With the assumption, the hypothesis was, and it's very well documented or, or said in the literature, though I would argue not well demonstrated, that as you increase the percent of your landscape in residential land, your nitrate yield will go up. Well, you see the trend there, but it's not significant at all, and very little of the variation is explained. So then I said, well, what are the possible explanations for this? First of all, our hypothesis can be just flat wrong. That's, that's always a possibility. Um, the other possibility is that we have a scale mismatch. There's relatively few places that we're actually collecting water relative to the scale of heterogeneity in the landscape, so that one number might not be real descriptive of the whole area. But that's very expensive data to get, so we're a little bit limited by that. And the other possibility is that we have the wrong view of heterogeneity. Using the land use, land cover, isn't a, a valid view of heterogeneity. So I'm gonna obviously start with this one and then go to this one for you. So here's this very same water data, only this time I've changed our view of structure of the landscape. This is the Hercules model for the entire watershed. And when I look at the percent, we don't have residential land in Hercules, but it's comparable. It depends on the building type. That's the patches I chose. With the same water data, we can see that it, it, it does seem to show a relationship. This, I don't want you to put too much weight on this. It's extremely preliminary and very coarse, but it gave us enough of an idea that maybe this was a valuable area of research to pursue. And so that's this, this kind of, this relationship that came out made us say, okay, let's drop down in scale now and see if we can't get a better match between the scale of heterogeneity in our system here and water quality and quantity coming out of the system. So we did that and we focused on these two, this uh, reference area up here, much more suburban area and down here in this dead run catchment, a much more uh, urban area and here's some shots of the dead run areas, and then as you move up the catchment, you can see they have very, this is the proportion cover of each of these watersheds, the small catchments we used, and the Hercules land covers. You can see that they vary widely. Um, this one here has a lot of tree cover, and this one here, dead run, has a lot more uh, pavement and, and uh, building cover. And that's not, you, you can see that just with your eye. Okay, so we were able to quantify the land cover differences, and then we took a look at we synoptically sampled all of these streams every week for a year and then looked at how these different relative covers of these different elements um, related to the nitrate concentration coming out of that water. And the only thing that turned up significant was the fine vegetation. Everything else was turned up insignificant. I should say that, again, this is very preliminary work um, and it taught us some very important lessons that we're now applying when we work in Sacramento. But it was very hard to tease these things apart because our statistical power is somewhat weak. Um, and uh, you know, this work is, is very time consuming and expensive, so it's hard to get enough statistical power. And then when we went back to our land cover and said, okay, that's weird that fine vegetation cover is related, but course isn't, what might be going on there? And it turned out that when we dug in a little bit deeper, this is one of those things that is aha, dummy. Um, some of these areas are on septic and some are on sewer. 
So when you're on septic, which is out here, you have lots of fine vegetation as your septic field. You're spreading nitrate out if your septic is working correctly. And that nitrate is what's getting into the water and what we're quantifying, okay? So we have a confounding factor in our, in our research of septic versus sewer. So that we learned some very important lessons about infrastructure and the incorporation of infrastructure um, in, in our research design. Okay, so uh, we talked about urban... <coughs> fine vegetation was the only variable that was, that was significantly related to nitrate export in these streams. And we think it's because where there's a lot of fine vegetation, it tends to be because these households or these neighborhoods are on septic. And so, so septic fields are herbaceous grass areas. And so we think there's a relationship there. Is that answer? Okay. All right, so I talked about the urban tree canopy. Um, you know, one of the reasons we do all this is that we're trying to figure out how can we modify the urban form to make the system more sustainable, to use a very big word. Um, and what ecosystem functions are the different structures carrying out? Okay, so structure function link. When I say function, it's also an ecosystem service from the point perspective of the human. So if we look at this, don't worry, but this is different kinds of forests that exist or trees that exist in an urban landscape arrayed along here. So you have trees that exist along a road and neighborhood areas in underutilized industrial areas all the way up to regional forestry. Okay, and then you also have processes or ecosystem services that these trees may be providing. They may be providing purifying drinking water, uh, scrubbing out air particulates. They may be building um, social capital or aesthetics or wildlife habitats. So you can have a whole series of ecosystem services that these trees are providing. And this is just an example of the kinds of tools that we try to generate to help decision makers prioritize their efforts. Okay, And then we rate them. Which ones have high effects? So, um, trees along the roads, they're going to have a high effect in mitigating stormwater runoff, okay? They're not going to have any effect really on drinking water, not just the trees along a road, okay? So we try to then give them, now none of these have necessarily been tested with rigorous data, but the idea is to help a decision maker understand all the different multivariable effects of trees in their system, okay? Depending on where those trees are and how much there are. Okay, so one of the ecosystem services that, that a forest canopy or a tree canopy in the city plays is heat dissipation. And I'm set being a little bit out of my comfort zone now because I'm going to be talking about some social data that we used. Um, but let me just spin this out for you. Tree canopies have heat, uh, heat dissipation properties, which is good. We've probably all heard about the urban heat island index, right? So we know that cities are hotter than <coughs> surrounding rural areas. And this is the Hercules map of the distribution of coarse vegetation. And this is a land surface temperature that we can get off the thermal bands of satellite images. And it's not surprisingly, where we have high coarse vegetation in these dark areas, it's where we tend to have low land surface temperature. And what we did was we just simply, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Kleinenberg's work in Chicago during the heat wave where a lot of people died in 1995. Kleinenberg then went into these neighborhoods and tried to assess the differential exposure or risk to the heat of different populations based on other characteristics of the neighborhood. What we're trying to do here is say, okay, yes, we have this Sorry, this is to tell you that heat now is the leading cause of natural disaster. I put that in quotes because I would argue it's not ne necessarily natural, but natural disaster mortality in the U.S. That's astounding to me. That is really astounding. Okay, so urban heat island is not homogeneous. There is heterogeneity within that. Yes, cities are hotter than surrounding areas. Sometimes. Phoenix, that's not true because everybody's watering. But there's a lot of heterogeneity within the urban landscape. And what this bar graph is showing you is all the, the mean temperatures of all the different census tract groups. Okay, so we've divided the landscape. Our, our unit of analysis for our watershed here is census block, sorry, block group. Okay, and so you can see that there's a wide distribution of average temperature across the city. So how does this affect or how is this related to? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, making a causal relationship, but how is it related to the distribution of people? And this is just to give you a brief sampling of the kinds of things we're doing. So here's now a spatial map. I just turned that data into space. Here's a spatial map of the distribution of the mean temperature, the darker colors or the, dark, or the hotter areas. And if we just show that in relationship to the medium household income, uh, the, dark, the lighter areas or the lower income, you can see that lower income communities typically are in the parts of the city that are hotter. 
Again, a no causal relationship here is just a spatial relationship. So these are often very, GIS is a very powerful tool to give to communities to work with their regulators and their managers. And so we've tried to think about what might be other potential tools for people making decisions on how to use limited resources. So in this map, we're showing hotspots outlined in, in the red and the colored. And so hotspots are block groups selected by having higher land surface temperatures, a lower medium household income, higher total crime, higher percentage of people older than 65, higher percentage of people who live alone, all the social variables that Klein and Berg sorted out that said was important for determining who experienced, experienced mortality, um, who didn't make it through the heat wave in Chicago, okay? So what we're able to do is set certain thresholds in all these variables and then highlight specific census block groups that are most vulnerable. Okay, which may be useful to a city official who has very limited resources and needs to figure out who in the population is most vulnerable and where are they. Okay, and then what's colored in is we just said, okay, we can change these thresholds. If your resources are even more limited than we thought, let's change the thresholds. And so you can do that. You can expand, you can decrease or increase your thresholds until you get the number of block groups that you can reasonably deal with with your resources. The other option potentially is to change the variables that you include. So in this map I'm showing you the areas, the red areas are the areas that have high hotspot, high temperature, and then the ones that have yellow are also the ones that have high crime because in many cases high crime increases vulnerability because people feel they can't get outside, okay, or they can't go to cooling areas. So you might focus on those areas if that's an issue in your city. So you can change the variables that you're, you're, um, that you're looking at. Okay, so the point being that all of these things have many different ecosystem services and those ecosystem services interact and that's the tricky bit. Okay, none of this is simple because there's never a one-to-one -one correlation. Many of these interact and I'm just going to show you some data here done on the interaction of property value, safety and cleanliness, and recreation in relation to uh, tree canopy and what you see here, or parks I should say. So we see here are two graphs. Okay, it's the calculated property value of properties in Baltimore with distance to a park in neighborhoods that have a crime index of 800 versus neighborhoods that have a crime index of 400. And the crime index is the percent over the national average. So this is 800, per, the national average is 100%, so this is eight times higher than the national average, this is four times higher than the national average. If you live in a neighborhood where your crime index is eight times the national average, the further away you are from a park, the higher the property value of your house, okay? And that is different when you live in a lower crime area. When you're in a lower crime area, the park becomes an amenity because you can get out and use it, you feel safer, and therefore your property values decline as you move further away from the park. So that's, these relationships are incredibly difficult to tease apart because of these kinds of things. And that's why people don't do it, because it's really, really hard, okay? We have interactions among variables. We have nonlinearities and thresholds in these variables. We have differences in preferences among social groups, and those preferences change through time. So these are understanding these issues of ecosystem services and therefore what makes a sustainable city is extremely difficult because of these reasons. So now I'm going to show you a little bit of, and I haven't gotten very far on this work because I'm relatively new to the Sacramento area, but now working in a very different biogeophysical context in a city, Sacramento, that looks, all of these again are cities, but Sacramento has a very bit different biogeophysical setting than Baltimore. It has very different culture, history, and, and economics, which is going to lead to very different dynamics. So we're asking the very same question about landscape structure and function. This now is our land cover map, not Hercules, the classic off-the-counter version of land use. Um, and again, asking about how it might be related to ecosystem function and water retention. Now heat, dis sorry. Yeah, the ecosystem functions of heat dissipation and water retention, two very critical ecosystem services for the city of Sacramento. To orient you, this is downtown. We have the Sacramento River that runs north-south and the American River here running east-west. Okay, so this is downtown going out to the Sierra and foothills. A lot of agriculture immediately outside the city. It's very flat, which will come into play later. Okay, as I said, heat is the number one um, cause of death, but natural disaster mortality in the U.S., but it also really interacts and affects water, uh, air quality. It affects ozone levels, and Sacramento has a very big problem with ozone, and we have spared the air days because our ozone levels are very, very high. So air quality is a huge issue in the Sacramento area. Here's the land surface data from the satellites, and let me just show you, again, the, the um, 
colors are the same, the darker areas are cooler, the lighter areas are hotter, and to give you a sense of what that looks like, the cooler areas are the irrigated croplands outside the city. The medium temperature areas are the residential communities. Sacramento, although it's in a grassland biome, has, has planted a lot of trees, as you can see. And then the very hot areas are the quote unquote remnant areas, the open grassland areas that are extremely hot. Okay, so we have a gradient of temperature. Um, what this, if we put this next to Baltimore, and I haven't gotten very far on this, but it's pretty interesting. And this is very conceptual. So you're going from your urban core, out from your urban core in Baltimore, you have these cul-de-sac communities, and as you move in, you have these row house communities. That's very, very, so you go from colder to hotter in Baltimore, okay? They get very, very hot in the city. I showed you some of the graphs earlier that showed you it was very hot. Sacramento, we might have just the opposite because the city's older and they planted the trees, so as you move towards the urban core, you have more trees. The suburban areas generally has a little bit more wealth. People aren't concerned with energy conservation. They're all air conditioned up the wazoo. So these folks are really relying on climate moderation and there's very little plantable space in these communities, property values and land values being what they are in California. So we're gonna have very different social dynamics. The biogeophysical relationships between temperature and vegetation structure probably aren't gonna change. But who's vulnerable in these landscapes may very much change. And so that's just a really fascinating thing that your ecosystem function and, and ecosystem services, those dynamics or those relationships are similar, similar, but how they're played out varies very much so based on the social context of your system. Sacramento is also the city in our country the most at risk of flooding and levee failure, okay? Much more than New Orleans is, believe it or not. No one believes me, but Sacramento is a huge floodplain, basically. Uh, the Sacramento and American River eventually flows into the Delta, which is economically and culturally extremely important for California. Uh, the runoff has been exacerbated, of course, by urban development. It also gets a lot of runoff from the Sierras, which is expected to go up as climate change scenarios predict that our rainfall in the Sierras will be less in the form of snow and more in the form of rain. Um, so what we're doing there is we've picked 10 residential watersheds in this study area as we move from the city out into the suburban areas to look at the same questions I asked in Baltimore, only this time the infrastructure is all the same and we have more statistical power. So the same kinds of things of quantifying water quantity and quality coming out of these residential communities that vary in structure based on our Hercules but this time getting rid of some of those confounding variables. And this is one of our catchments, the one that was outlined in the previous slides. So we're working on very small headwater streams, measuring the water here. What's underneath, so this is our topographical catchment, okay? All the water that lands here is gonna go into this blue line, this stream. What I've put behind here is the infrastructural map, okay? And so what you can see is all the pipes underground, the length of the width of the line is the size of the pipes. You can see all the um, manhole covers, all the, the inlets and outlets. If we take into consideration the infrastructure, then our catchment boundaries are very different. So you have connected anywhere where the pipes are leading to an outfall into that stream. That now has to be considered part of the catchment, right? We've changed the underground structure or the hydrologic structure through our piping. Now this, because Sacramento is so flat relative to Baltimore, this is increasingly important in that flat topography because it's not an it's not a engineering feat necessarily to break a natural um, catchment boundary when your landscape is essentially flat. In Baltimore, it's much more hard to do that because you'd have to blow through some topographical barriers and infrastructurally, you just wouldn't have done that. You would have put all your pipes in the topographical breaks. So that's a feature of because our context now has shifted to a flat landscape, we have to think a little bit different excuse me, a little bit differently. So that changes our spatial catchment of what we might consider now of what is going to influence the flow of this river. We are still um, measuring water in a surrounding area in the remnant native landscape, which looks like that. That's what we've lost in California. Um, and we're doing that to just get as reference site, to get a sense. And what we've already learned is that in the summer, as you know, California has distinct wet and dry seasons. So in the summer, these rivers don't flow anymore. These streams don't flow, they're ephemeral. And this stream dried up. We're doing Deer Creek Hills here. This stream dried up in the summer as we would expect. None of our residential streams dried up. And the reason being that we have so much irrigation happening in homeowner property that it's essentially all the water that's in these rivers. So we've fundamentally shifted our rivers now from being ephemeral to be, to be perennial. And all the water coming in that's eventually going to the delta is laden with anything any homeowner is putting on their, their property. So a fundamental shift. Okay, 
So I'm sorry, I've completely lost track of time. Okay. So what do I mean by sustainability? This is a huge word. When Ann told me what this thing was on, I was like, no, that word. Um, and so I just want to give you a couple of little things that have come out of how ecologists have been thinking about it. And, and we grapple with it all the time. I mean, it's just constantly a source of conversation. But here's a couple of definitions. The ability of an ecosystem to maintain ecological processes, functions, biodiversity, and product, productivity into the future and capable of being continued with minimal effect on the environment. So this view of sustainability or these definitions of sustainability from the ecological literature are very much focused on extraction and resource use. Okay? How much resources can you continue to use with minimal effect on the environment or so that you can continue to use that resource in per perpetuity, if that makes sense. Okay? So the way that we often think about it is this way, in the terms of ecosystem services, which I've talked about a little bit before. And this is a, essentially a report card done by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that took a look at a bunch of different ecosystem services and what were going up and what were going down over the last 50 years. And what was going up essentially was food production, but most everything else was being decreased, okay? Now ecologists are very good at saying that something has gone down and that we must stop all activity. We're not very good at coming up with suggestions on how to potentially either prevent it or to enhance functionality. So ecosystem services is a very important framework um, for ecologists, but it's done through the perspective of what is useful for humans, right? It's only a service if it's somebody's using it, otherwise why have it? So a very related but less, less influence, and this is a very nuanced difference um, on resource extraction, is this concept of resilience that we use in ecology a lot. And that's basically the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to retain essentially the same function, identity, and feedbacks. Okay? Little bit different, little more nuanced, um, but it's not so focused on resource extraction or use of the system. And to give you some cartoons of what that might look like, this is the diagrams that we use when we talk about resilience theory and ecology, where basically you have a system represented by the line, <coughs> and you have tr uh, the troughs in this line represent stable states of your system. Okay, which could be characterized by anything. In this case, I'm giving you that your system could be 100% grass or 100% trees. Okay, so there's two states that your system can exist in. And where the ball is tells you where your system is at the current time. So in this figure, your system is currently at 100% at grass or maybe inching towards having a little bit along this continuum, inching towards having a little bit of, of woody plants. So what that means then is what we're interested in, so here's the definition again, is when you're moving between troughs or stable states of your system, how resilient is your system, meaning what's the difficulty or the resistance, the difficulty of changing your system? How large of a disturbance or how large of a push do you need to kick your system into a different state? Okay, that's one thing we want to know. The other thing we want to know is currently how precarious is your system? How close is it to that tipping point to moving into a second stable state? And the third characteristic we like to know about systems is how broad is that trough? How much wiggle room do you have? If you get one hurricane, is that okay? If you harvest your crop three times in a row, three times in a year, is that okay? Can your system still slosh around in this trough? Or is that enough to kick it over? You know, have you depleted the nutrients enough where it's now no longer that recognizable system? Okay, so that's what we call latitude. How much of the system cha can change before losing its ability to reorganize? So the issue here is systems are going to change. Sometimes when people talk about sustainability, they really think about maintaining the status quo. Well, we know in ecology that if anything happens, systems change. Systems always change. They're changing all the time. They change at lots of different time scales, but they're always changing. The issue is, what's that envelope of change that's acceptable? How much can it slosh around before you kick it into some irreparable, or it could be over here, and then the issue is how much restoration effort do you need to get it back over to what you want? Now, these are all human uh, latent things, of course, because we have to decide. The critical challenge then is to figure out what is a big enough push to kick it over into another stable state. And then we have to ask questions about if you kick it over, is it just simply that you have two states that your system is, can exist and move back and forth between? Or have you fundamentally altered your system such that the previous state no longer can exist? Okay. Okay. So this is often typically the model of sustainability. This is an icon that is used in our literature a lot, the spider web. And this I use a lot because it's a good reminder that, yeah, ecological processes are part of resilience. And 
but there's a lot of other things, obviously, <laughs> you don't need to tell this group. But what this basically means is that you have to recognize that when you alter a system, either through management choices or regulation choices or just simple use or, or, or neglect, you're altering the ability of that system to make profit or to deter pests or to keep good soil quality. And the length of the line represents how sustainable or how healthy your system is. So as your system, as that length gets down, you have less quality of life but higher resilience, for example, okay? So these are the kinds of diagrams that we often use to evaluate systems and how well we're doing. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. But the idea is that these systems are very highly integrated and if we want to build them, maintain them, manage them, restore them into being sustainable, whatever that might mean, we have to decide because that's no longer a scientific Science can inform, but that you bring in a whole lot of social values with that. Um, then we need to think about it as an integrated system, and we need to use variables that make sense to ask our questions about the link between structure and function. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. You showed us some data from the Chicago heat wave data. No? You were showing, you, what I was, was showing Baltimore. Oh, you're showing Baltimore. You're making the claim about but I was Chicago. Saying, it, I was saying that that work was resonated with Kleinenberg's work in okay. Chicago. Yeah. Because I was just going to ask about the uh, the whole controversy around Kleinenberg's work. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with this. That Denier went back to the neighborhoods and claimed that he had misrepresented the data. Yeah, yeah there's or, been a lot so of criticism because. I guess the qu question would be, what's the, how reliable are these data in general? Baltimore, Sacramento, Chicago, right. um, if there's this controversy. Right. Um, well, I, I don't know, have you read Kleinenberg's book? So it doesn't really have a whole lot of data other than demographic data of specific neighborhoods based on who went to some of the cooling thing, cooling centers and who didn't and who died and where they lived and general uh, demographic makeup. Um, but he didn't actually quantify land, he didn't quantify temperature differences across the landscape. Um, so yes, there is a lot of criticism on Kleinenberg's work. Um, the, e the other side of the criticism is that the criticizers, <laughs> um, there just isn't the statistical power in that data to be able to definitively say. It's just two different interpretations of the data is my understanding of the controversy. So it's definitely not um, a definitive statement on the relationships. So yes, you're right, I'm not making any claims about Kleinenberg's work, I'm suggesting that some of these relationships may hold true and now we're trying it with data because he didn't have a lot of that data. And obviously we don't have mortality data either. We're just assessing vulnerability. We're not assessing um, actual, if, if, if people, I don't know how to say it nicely. But anyway, um, so it's, yeah. It's, but you're right, there is a lot of controversy over Kleinenberg's analysis. Can I ask about the micro scale of the um, the urban forestry and the current strategies? Uh, as as you um, have pointed to the capacity of of patches to uh, retain nitrates and the capacity of trees to do so, mm -hmm. is it the case that the uh, tree planting strategies with very small uh, tree wells, um, monocultures, industrially produced? Um, uh, is that really maximizing the, any of the uh, ecosystem services that the um, trees provide and how do you or how can you recommend from the, the um, really incredibly uh, fantastic analysis that you've done from sort of coming at a lot of different um, angles, you know, the simple and most direct actions that people are taking to plant trees, and in New York, of course, the Million Tree Project, which is not in any way designed by or for or to maximize these ecological services, to put you know, evenly spaced trees decoratively along a tree, uh, along a road, in, uh, and surround it with uh, cement and cover it with you know, impact, you know, it, does that, at yeah, what I mean, point, a, how, how do you inform urban forestry from this yeah, work? Yeah, I mean, there's is a the right and a point. wrong way to plant a tree. Um, but the idea that we're using in Baltimore is that once that data came out and that we needed this distributed idea of getting more trees in the catchment, we work with a nonprofit agency there called Parks and People Foundation. 
And they do a lot of uh, greening activities. And in Baltimore, I actually, many people call it a curse, I call it a blessing, has 70,000 vacant lots and vacant homes. So they've got a lot of open space in their urban area that is rare. Um, and so that's an opportunity to really dramatically change the structure of the system because it doesn't look like a lot of residents are going to move back in, so they might as well use the space. So through the Parks of People Foundation and community greening projects, which are very well established in Baltimore at the neighborhood scale, um, there's been a lot of concerted effort to plant large patches, whole uh, vacant lots, whole, um, because it's a row house construction, they often will take out the entire row. So it's a very large area. They essentially have agricultural old fields in the middle of the city. So it's, it's, it's more than just planting along the road. It's a lot more than just planting along the road. And the other thing they're doing is they're, they're greening these alleyways. They're taking out, we have um, in one of our test areas a commitment from the Department of, um, Department of the Environment? Department of I can't remember the acronym. There's too many. All the cities are a little bit different. But anyway, to remove 30% of the paved surfaces. So they're going in with their big yellow trucks and ripping off pavement. And we've done it in small catchments that we can isolate the piping to so that we can quantify the change in the water quality over time. So we actually have instruments down a manhole cover in some of these places. And so the thought or the hope is that if we can change, remove a lot of the impervious surfaces and plant those areas that we may see a change in the water quality and quantity. And that's a challenge for us. We're still in, in the process of doing that quote unquote experiment. Um, it has caught the attention of the residents in the neighborhood and a lot of those alley greening ways have been spurred from that because it's more visible and they see those changes and they're changing some of those alleyways into rain gardens <coughs> to bring the, the water up to the surface and, and decrease the pavement. So it's kind of both, you know, I say green it up, gray it down. I mean, it, it, it's a little bit of both. Get more, more canopy in there but also decrease the gray. Um, like you say, planting it in these small tree wells along a, a city street here and then essentially having pavement all around it is going to do little for water. It might do quite a bit actually for sequestering particulates in the air, um, which we would all be appreciative of. So how you realize it differs the consequences for different ecosystem services. Because the trees can play many roles, but it depends on the context, um, what species they are, how big they are, how big they are relative to the built structure around them immediately, uh, how they're maintained, and where they're placed in the landscape. All of that comes into play to determine of the array of ecosystem services they could provide, which ones are they providing. And that's how we use those spider diagrams. We may array instead around there different ecosystem services, water quality, air quality, aesthetics, cap social capital. We show, we've seen examples where when you plant up a neighborhood, the people just get much more involved and engaged in their neighborhood. They're much more active in crime watch and, and things like that. And so social you know, capital through greening. Those are different ecosystem services that tree can provide, and you can maximize some, and some aren't going to be maximized. Does that answer your question? So I was really fascinated by your graph of the distance from parks and yeah. the interaction with crime is really interesting. So do you get any Baltimore, the wire is a high crime city. Do any residents resist the greening of space because they well, the absolutely are going to be there? Cetera, yeah, absolutely. Um, so how do you deal with that? Yeah, there's a couple of ways that there's resistance. Crime is the number one reason for resistance. The other reason for resistance, although it's diminished through time, but historically much more important were certain communities of peoples that didn't like messy streets and trees made mess, <coughs> so they wanted them all cut down. So those are kind of the two ways that we see resistance happening. Um, the crime issue, the way that we've gotten around it is to involve the residents in designing the space. So as ecologists, we have to step way back and get off the high horse of no, no non-native species because structurally, they've got a very important function, right? They need to see through the trees. They want to be able to see who's on the street and what's going on. So they want trees with dappled shade, trees that will give some shade but that they can see through. So that means the native oaks and are out. I mean, they just have too dense of a shade. They can't see through them. So we have to use some of the exotic species. Many from China have that kind of structure to them. So we do design with the neighborhoods. The other thing, too, is the example I gave you of removing the pavement and planting up, one of those was in a reading circle in an elementary school. That they didn't know what to do with the land, so they just paved it. And it was huge. I mean, the school had a parking lot like 10 times bigger than any you would normally see. 
And so we took out a lot of that parking lot and instead planted a reading circle and got the kids involved and the teachers involved to design that. And their school is right across the street from a bank of row houses that are abandoned and have a lot of drug activity. So what they wanted was we couldn't plant trees of the age that we would normally plant that are cheaper to install and maintain. They needed bigger trees so that the vegetation, the branching, was higher than the kids so that they could see at all times from the school into that reading circle and see the kids in that reading circle. So it comes down to working with the neighborhoods and, and focusing on the function, not necessarily what's native or non-native. Yeah. 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 So the question was um, that I mentioned that there was most potential for greening in the private property, and, and the question was, is that in Baltimore or in general, or just was that data from Baltimore? Yeah. So, and, and how would I manage that? Yeah, that's the big. I mean, that's why it's so important to work with communities because they control the land and they're the managers, right? So that's why it's so important to get community, and that's why I show that data. It's like, yeah, we can do all, all we want with the urban forestry department, and every city has one, I think, um, but they can only go so far, right? We really have to get the residents involved, and so that's why it's so critical that we have this um, Parks and People Foundation that is on the ground, is very well respected in the community, does a lot of variety of programming from education to after school programs to the kids to Sunday greenings in the, in the neighborhoods. Um, because we do have to use that private property space. But that data was from Baltimore. That's not unusual in cities. Uh, it's probably unusual for this city. This city is just different, right? You guys know that. I mean, people's property is like up in the air. Um, but in, in a lot of cities that are more residential in nature, like single family homes or even row houses, uh, a lot of the plantable space is in private, private ownership. Yeah, and institutional ownership, certainly, but so that's why I bring that up, because that is so fascinating to me. That forces the ecologists to work with non-ecologists if they want to do the effect change. We can't just go in and plop a bunch of trees down. Can I ask the last question? OK. <laughs> Uh -huh. that a lot of the things that you take as, or uh, have assumed that we'd be familiar with, you kind of, you know, explain to us that ecologists don't get this. And I'm curious if you can just leave us with some, some sense of your experience in trying to present this kind of data to an ecological audience. I mean, it was really striking to me that you're redefining, for instance, the, the very definition of a riparian zone. <laughs> right. Right. And, right. And, and, um, can you just give us a sense of what, if, if we were to talk about the audience for this kind of research and these, the tools that you're developing, like Hercules, mm -hmm. being an ecosystem science audience, mm -hmm. right? What, what kinds of challenges do you face? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and they're in different arenas. Do I need to repeat the question for the, okay. Um, the challenges are, are kind of multiple fold, but before I, I I say what the challenges are, I should say that, that the field of ecology is rapidly changing. Um, I told a story in the class today that when I was a graduate student in 1995, going to my national meetings at the Ecological Society of America and sitting on the mountaintop in Utah, and one of my fellow students from some other university said, so what do you work on? I told him, well, that's not ecology. Um, so we've gone from that to the National Science Foundation funding two long-term research programs in Baltimore and Phoenix because they recognize urban areas as biomes, okay? So that's a really radical shift in our field. Um, that same network of sites, of research sites that the National Science Foundation has, has funded is made up mostly of ecosystem ecologists and we meet every three years. We just did this past September. And over the last nine years, there's been a marked increase in, in in um, social science, atten social scientists attending these meetings of all types, urban his uh, historians, economists, sociologists, all, all different types. Um, and that's led us to cr try to create as best we can an integrated framework of ecological sciences and social sciences through using ecosystem services as the glue, okay? So we can study our structure function. Ecologists are very comfortable with that. How does that affect ecosystem services, which then kicks into gear um, the the social 
forget now what's over there. Oh God, I'm showing what hat I wear. Um, <laughs> social response and, and yeah, something like that. Anyway, um, so that's an integrated framework and that's really new. That's in the last year. So our field is changing extremely quickly. People are, are very clearly getting the message that there is no such thing as a pristine system, which okay, granted, it, it took them a little long to get to. There are still some challenges. Um, the data, actually, because I use the ecos because I use ecosystem budgets, bi budget chemical budgets, because I use the watershed approach, because I use spatial heterogeneity and ecosystem function, they are very comfortable, and that's why I use those things, and that's why I say, look, guys, these things all look familiar to you. Take a deep breath; it's okay. You'll survive, um, and that's why I do that. Not only to help define what urban ecology is, because they immediately think that I'm doing something really weird, but also to kind of calm them down and recognize that they will understand most of what's going to happen to them in the next next hour. Um, but, the, but the challenges are that they, uh, first of all, they all, by and large, they're very glad that someone like me is doing the research. They just don't want to do it because it's hard. Um, and it's hard to work. And because it also involves uh, being very multidisciplinary and trying to integrate and learn all sorts of new disciplines. Not that I ever will be an expert in anything other than my field of study. But I have to be able to have conversations and find appropriate colleagues in all these different areas and be willing to respect and understand that there's a whole intellectual um, richness behind their fields that I don't know nothing about. Okay. And that is a big problem in the rigorous science and the not, you know, non-rigorous, I don't know, soft, hard, whatever people use, that's a big issue of people not recognizing that there's an intellectual uh, rigor in the other side. Um, so that often is, is a barrier because there's a lot of skepticism between the two fields. Um, I've kind of forgotten. Am I answering your question? Sure. <laughs> uh, but do you want more tangible? It's very difficult to publish, yeah. for example. I got a great review. I wrote a paper with a social scientist at Arizona State, and the review said, this is simply an awful paper to read which I've never quite seen a review like that. And then it went on to say, oh, but it's really important work and it's really great that they use Hercules because that's actually getting some, some traction in the field. It's getting recognized. Um, and it's really important that we recognize this and we have to publish and we have to publish but we have to let the social scientists write it. So the issue is just the different culture and writing style. You guys write beautifully. We write in bullet points, right? There's no beauty in our writing. Um, so it's, it's a really different culture in giving talks and you know when I invite a social scientist to give a talk I kind of hold my breath because if they come and they read it oh death that's it done um, it's just because the cultures are so different our historians come and they sit there and they read and yeah it's 12 minutes that's true they read and the ecologists are like nee, 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 because there's no pretty pictures there's no graphs and they can't maintain their focus they can't do that we don't do that so culturally there's very different strategy in writing and, and giving lectures which is a barrier um, what else is a barrier? Yeah, and just recognizing, I mean, we all are in institutional structures in a university. Yeah, my university says it's great to be interdisciplinary, but <clears throat> how do they evaluate me? Very difficult within the, the confines of a plant sciences department. You know, so you've got institutional barriers like that. Uh -huh.